Good morning. Our verse on our bulletin this morning says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Our announcements this morning, our youth Bible study and adult Bible study will be starting back this Wednesday. So at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary or over in the fellowship hall, the youth will be meeting, and we'll be here continuing our study on the book of Proverbs uh, I did the math on it. It looks like we might be in Proverbs for about a year and a half total. I don't know. So if you need wisdom as much as I do, that doesn't sound so bad, right? So if you're anybody who wants wisdom for the new year uh, with how incredibly up, up, upheaval and, and just all the craziness that we have going on in our country right now, this is a good time for us to draw near to the Lord and seek wisdom. That's for sure. Um, there are copies of Mature Living magazine for you over there right in the fellowship hall when you walk in. Also, for, for our new year, I'm going to start listing sort of what my sermon topics are for the next week and the verses. So if you're somebody who likes to read ahead, you can read the before, you can read the after, you can, you can come to church ready. I'm not trying to give you homework, but if you're looking for something to read in the mornings at church or as you're getting ready, or even just listen on an app on your phone. I love listening to the Bible sometimes more than reading it, to be honest with you. But uh, So next week... I'll, it'll be on the greedy baker, bankers, and that'll be from John chapter 2. So that's the famous passage of Jesus turning the t- tables over in the temple. So that's going to be exciting. Um, on Monday, not this coming Monday, but the following Monday, a Martin Luther King Day, we're going to have an opportunity for people to come for a day of prayer. With all of the people that are, that are getting COVID and just the way that our, our country is just seeming to be in a constant state of attack, a couple of church leaders just came to me and, and talked about just the need for prayer. So anybody who wants to, the church is going to be open pretty much all day. Um, I'm going to come up here around six in the morning, make sure the church is unlocked for people to come in to pray. And then it'll be open until eight that evening for anybody who wants to just come into the church. And, you know, you can make whatever you want to be the, the focus. And listen, you don't have to come inside the church to pray. If you want to be a part of our day of prayer, you can just sit in your car right outside the church on that day and pray. But we are going to have the church open. And what we want you to pray about is is kind of obvious in some ways. But I'm just going to tell you, just the state of our nation, uh, just the infighting. I mean, this is how countries fall apart. Our country is starting to feel more like a third world country than a first world country. All right. And for anyone who's done any traveling, you can you can understand what I'm saying when I say that's a scary thing. All right. So we need to be in prayer for our leaders. We need to be in prayer for the people. And, and honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I don't care what side of the political divide that you're on. We all need Jesus and we all need to act as Christians. Christianity should be a unifying thing that regardless of your personal feelings about what's going on, that we can come together and pray not just for peace and not just against violence, But pray that God's name would be made great and that our country would wake up. Pray for revival. Pray for direction. Hey, come into the church. Pray for me. Pray for my family. Pray for our our, our, uh, revival for our personal church this year. Whatever God puts on your heart to pray for, that's what I want you to come and pray for. So that's not tomorrow, but that's going to be next Monday, okay? And so some people work and some people don't, but, but I just felt like that gives you an opportunity if you'd like to, to be part of a time of prayer. Also, we have several prayer requests this morning on our prayer sheet. Uh, we have Sandy Brandy, Doug and Shirley Christopher, Ray Fuller, Brack Lewis, Stephen Wynn, Sandy Walker, the family of Tommy Glosson, the family of Horace Ward, Larry Lindsley, and the family of Joe Larry Jones. So we want to be in specifically in prayer for those families that are dealing with difficulties at this time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you this morning with hearts heavy, burdened for our nation. And we ask in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this would be a sanctuary this morning, Father. That we would come and we would lay our fears and our anxiety, our uncertainties about the future and everything that that might represent down outside this building. And that we might come in here and worship you. That we would worship you this morning in spirit and truth for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you continue to do in our lives. 
We lift up each and every prayer request on this sheet, God, and those that aren't mentioned as well. And we ask that you would do a work in their lives and a work in our lives. Be especially with those who have lost loved ones in the past six months. It's a difficult, trying time to be alive right now. But God, I know that every hard time in my life became a testimony of your greatness later in my life. And so I just pray that you would hold us close to you right now, that we can remember all the goodness and mercy and truth that you've given us, even in the midst of 2020. That God, you would lead us and that you would guide us. Be with us this morning as we worship you. Help us in song. Help us as we listen to a sermon. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, and make us ready to respond. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. We sing hymn number 223, Alleluia. Sing all four verses. <laughs> As we prepare our hearts to receive God's word today, uh, we're going to be reading from John chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was, the, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. From, for, his, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this good day and for this opportunity that we have to come to your house and to worship you. And Lord, we are so thankful that you did send your Son to die on the cross for us, our sins, Lord, and that we can receive your grace that we don't deserve, Lord. We're just so thankful for that that you offer that freely for us. We just have to accept it and just helps us to go throughout this today to do everything to your honor and glory and, and be with Josh as he comes and brings the message that you would give him the words that we need to hear, that we may go out differently than what we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This morning we're starting a new series. It's going to be through the Gospels. We're not going to just look at Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John individually, but we're going to look at each one of them and look at some of the stories of Jesus and the encounters that he had with people. And what happened when Jesus met people face to face and how were their lives changed? And what happened in these interactions to cause their lives to be different? This morning, we have the first in the series, and that is on John the Baptist. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, please. Matthew chapter 3. We'll be in Matthew chapter 3 and John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. So up here, you'll be able to see after the, we read the verses that we'll have both sections up there. Matthew chapter 3. And we're just going to start in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We are to have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. And every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. I hope you had a good Christmas. I had a great Christmas. It was wonderful to sort of get away from where I've called home for the past six months and just kind of hit that reset button. And in fact, the COVID rate was even lower in Illinois where we were than it is here. So it's a little bit crazy to come back. I was less worried about traveling than I was about getting here in some ways. But here's the thing. Judah got to experience something he never experienced before. And that is he got to meet seven girl cousins that he had never met before. (laughs) Ranging in age from about 13 years old to 22 years old. Judah got to experience what it's like for girls to fight over holding him, feeding him, taking care of him. He got to experience what it looked like for his mom and dad to sit across the room in a couch happy, (laughs) watching him being held by relatives. Judah learned a lot that week. He learned what it was like to be loved on by so many different people. Unfortunately, he learned how to scream in a new way when he was tired of it. But, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was left changed. He met his cousins and he's changed. He knows more about love. He knows more about family. He knows more about extended family. Even I got to meet some family members of Anna's that I had never known before. And those relationships impact us. They change us and they shape us. And believe it or not, Jesus and John the Baptist are related. In fact, they're probably cousins, second cousins, because Mary and Elizabeth are first cousins. Their moms are first cousins. So Jesus and John have an encounter in the Judean wilderness. So two cousins meet up 
and they have an encounter that changes the trajectory, honestly, of both of their lives, because this is the start of Jesus' public ministry. And as we'll see, it is an impact that leads to the whole rest of John's life. But as we look at each character, we have to ask ourselves, who are these people that Jesus is encountering each week? Who is John? Well, as I said before, he is related to Jesus. He was born to grateful parents. In fact, his father didn't believe that he could be conceived. They were old, advanced in years, both his mother and his father, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And I don't know how he did this, but good old Zechariah told the angel, I don't believe you. <laughs> the angel of the Lord said, your wife's going to give birth to a son in nine months, and he's going to be the forebearer for the Messiah. And Zechariah said, I don't think so. I just don't see it. You know how old we are? And the angel of the Lord said, you're not going to talk for nine months because you didn't believe what God promised to you. So I want you to think about that for a second. What would it do to your faith growing up if whenever your mom told you your birth story, there was a line in there about, it was the most peaceful nine months of my life <laughs> because I didn't hear from your daddy once. The first time he opened his mouth was to name you John. Think how that would stir your faith and grow your faith and encourage you in your faith. And that's the household that John grew up in. The second thing we see from the first verse here in chapter 3 is in those days, John the Baptist came preaching, which means he was a preacher. So John the Baptist was a preacher who preached. His message was simple. It's a message that we need today just as much than he needed in those days, which is to repent. How many times do we hear about repentance today in our society? We hear about tolerance. We hear about excusing sin. We hear about people getting even upset if you call sin a sin. I even had people attack me recently because I said that marriage wasn't only between a man and a woman. Some people need to repent. You can't be a practicing Christian with active sin in your lives. Repent. He preached that time and time again. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, he didn't know exactly what was coming next, just like we don't know what's coming next. But let me tell you something. Repentance is always a good action to take when you're uncertain about the future. In fact, repentance is not something that we do once and forget about. We should be in an active, living life of repentance. That is what it means to be an active, spirit-filled Christian. Every day, we need to get up and search our hearts and our souls before the Lord and ask God, God, what in me is not of you? What in me is not of you? What do I need to repent of? What do I need to turn away from? Crucify my flesh that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. For the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. That is what we must pray every day. The third thing we learn about John is that he lived a rugged life. He forged for food off the land. He was a duck dynasty, Jeremiah Johnson, forest, mountain man kind of guy. For some of y'all, he'd be right at home. And for others of us, we might ask him to take a more dunks in the Jordan before he comes in our house. He smelled like it. He ate like it. <laughs> he was a wild man. I want you to think about what this would be like to have a wild person who lived off the land and had these religious beliefs that were so different. He lived out in the country, in the wilderness from everybody else. He was separate completely from everyone else else. He was different and he didn't hide it. Sometimes we want to work so hard today to make ourselves look like everybody else, to make ourselves seem like everybody else. When God called us to be a peculiar people, he called us to be a strange people, a different people. We're supposed to look different and sound different and behave different. And boy, John the Baptist, with the way he lived our lives, sure demonstrated what it looks like to live a life different than everyone else. The fourth thing we see is that he baptized in the country away from the city. People came from all over the place. In fact, he's the most famous preacher in the country at this point. Take Tony Evans, Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley, all your favorite preachers, roll them up into one. And you got the fame of John the Baptist. Even the politicians came into the wilderness to see what this religious movement was all about. You know what that would be like? It'd be like if down here by the Hall River, somebody went into the woods over here and just set up camp. And they said, repent, the kingdom of God's at hand. 
And people started coming from all over North Carolina and all over the country to come and see what this movement is right, right by this river in the middle of uh, nowhere in the wilderness. And people came from miles around just to come and see what movement of God was taking place because there was something different. In fact, Jesus comes and says, there is no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. I had a guy, Cody, asked me one time, and he had been a Christian for about two months. And he said, Josh, does that mean John the Baptist is a better man than me? I said, yes, Cody. (laughs) John the Baptist is a better man than you. He's a better man than me. And he's a better man than any of us. So he was different. His righteousness was different. The way he lived his life was different. He was weird in a good way. My wife gets on me sometimes because I use the word weird. And I don't always mean it in a bad way. You can be weird in a good way. You can be different in a good way. You can be peculiar in an important, significant way. And that's the person that John the Baptist was. And by the way, John the Baptist, he's not John the Sprinkler, y'all. You know? He's not John the Sprinkler, you know. Baptize means to dip, emerge, or plunge, okay. He wasn't putting a little bit of them in there. He was dunking their whole thing, all right. And it's a religious thing that Jews did throughout history was to practice baptism. So he's doing something that is within their religious beliefs, but he's doing it in a different way. And what happens? The Republicans and the Democrats both show up. That's what happens. You know, it's crazy to me that God led this on my heart weeks ago, honestly months ago, that I would preach this as I came back. We live in a time and a place and where our country is just so busy pointing the finger at everybody. Nobody wants to repent of their own sin anymore. All they want to talk about is everybody else's sin. And there's no bigger problem than when it comes to our politicians. Lord forbid if they take it respect and responsibility for their own actions. So the Republicans and the Democrats come out here by Hall River and they come talk to John. He's by there. He smells different. He looks different. He just got done eating some bugs and some honey. He's got a little Winnie the Pooh vibe going on. And they come out to him and he's different. He smells different. He looks different. He is different. And he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Republicans and the Democrats, coming to his baptism. And he says to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee, the wrath is to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. John challenges religious people. John challenges religious people. He calls them a brood of vipers, which, you know, that's not a good thing. In English, in Greek, in Aramaic, it's the same thing. He's calling them bunch of snakes. It's not good. He's calling them snakes because they lie and they cheat and they do what is best for themselves. Doesn't that sound like our politicians? We want to act like so much has changed, but that was their religious leaders. Those were their politicians. And we are in the exact same situation 2,000 years later that they were in that day by the Jordan. And as they come He tells them they need to show who they are. And we can apply that to our lives today too, right? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You need to bear fruit. You need to bear fruit. You need to bear fruit. You're okay. No, we all need to bear fruit. This isn't about somebody else. We're all to bear fruit. We're all to show that we are Christians by the way in which we live our lives. Don't think. Listen. He even says this, which is amazing to me. He says, don't think just because you're related to Abraham that God sees you in some kind of special, provisional way. Don't think because you're Southern Baptist or because your mom was a good Christian or because your grandma was a good Christian or because your auntie cooks and bakes every time we have a little get-together that you are bearing fruit. John says, you bear fruit. And I tell you the same thing. You need to bear fruit. Be honest about your intentions. Don't hide behind political statements. Don't hide behind falsehoods. Even if we're just talking about the sin in our heart, not even the things that we say out loud and do, we all need to repent. We need to be in a lifestyle of repentance. That's what it means to be a Christian. Live in a lifestyle of repentance and show that you're saved by the way in which you live your lives. Repent and bear fruit. Don't hide behind popular culture. Don't hide behind politicians. And listen, don't pretend that sin's not fun. Any preacher who tells you sin's not fun is a liar. Sin is fun. Listen, it's fun to get angry at at politicians. 
It's fun to yell at people who think differently than you. It gives us a rush. It's fun. That's why we do it in marriage sometimes. But listen, you got to live together in marriage. And so you have to make up. You have to apologize. You have to come back together. But we think because we live in a society that gives us this closeness and this distance at the same time that we can say and do whatever. No, we need to stop pretending and we need to repent of our part and bear fruit. We need to not be so worried about what is on somebody else's paper and worry about what's on our paper. It doesn't matter whether they're cheating. It matters whether we're cheating. It's about our responsibility before God, not anyone else's responsibility. I mean, how do we act like we're saved in this political environment? How do we act like we're saved with COVID and the election? I just want to ask you this question. Would people be surprised to find out that you're a Christian? I mean, that's the litmus test. Are people surprised to find out you're a Christian? Oh, I didn't think you would be a church-going person. I don't see any of that morality in your life every day. (laughs) Really? You go to church? Really? People should not be surprised that you have a moral compass. They should not be surprised when they look at your social media. They shouldn't be surprised when they look at your emails, your Snapchat, your Facebook, your Instagram. They shouldn't be surprised. They shouldn't even be surprised at your TikToks, y'all. They shouldn't be surprised at anything, all right? They should know that we are religious Christian people by the way in which we live our lives. And if that comes as a surprise, that's a problem that you need to address with God. The other thing about John is he's so humble. Look at verse 12. Or excuse me, verse 11 and then 12. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But listen, who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I remember translating these verses in my Greek class. And what it actually says here, John says about Jesus, that the one who's coming after me, I'm not worthy to touch the strap of his sandal. That's what he says. I'm not worthy to touch the strap of his sandal. Now that's humility. John knew that he wasn't worthy. I don't know, some of you this is too old for, some of you this is too new for, but I remember in Carowinds, they had a little section of the park. And they had this roller coaster called the Hurler, right? And that was from Wayne's World. And and in Wayne's World, they had Wayne's World 1 and Wayne's World 2. And in Wayne's World, the two main characters, Garth and Wayne, they would always do this thing, all right? If they saw someone who was attractive or talented or famous, they would do this thing. And when when they saw them, they would go, we're not worthy, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. Because they didn't think they were worthy. Listen, John knew that he wasn't worthy to touch the sandal of Jesus' clothing. But how many of us live our lives as if God has to convince us of his worthiness? God, if you would only answer my prayer like this, God, if you would only move in this way, God, if you would only do this or that or the other, then I will move in the way you want, then I'll repent, then I'll bear fruit. But God, you don't know what they said to me. But God, you don't know how much that hurt me. But God, you don't know how angry I am at them. No, listen. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what anyone else did. It doesn't matter what anyone else said. You don't think I'm angry? Listen, God is a joker. I have advanced degrees in two areas, okay? I have a master's in international relations. So I studied politics and history and philosophy because I thought I was going to be working for the government. But God had another plan, so now I have degrees in Christianity. So the two things people fight the most about in this country right now, religion and politics, you don't think I get aggravated? You don't think I get upset? But I'm just telling you, it's not worth our time or our effort to attack these people. I don't care what somebody believes. They're still a person. And they're still made in the image of God. And that's got to come first and foremost. Like when you're lining up to take a shot with a rifle, you've got to look through the front scope and you've got to look through the back sight, right? You've got to look through both of them in order to get a good shot. You've got to line them up. You have to do the same thing. Look at that person as a person. They're not less than a person because they think differently than you. If you think that, then you need to repent. 
I'm tired of people in this country acting like there's levels of humanity. There's not levels of humanity. We cannot sit up here and say that we value the life of the unborn, but when they grow up and they have different beliefs than us, we no longer value them in the same way. That's hypocrisy. We need to live our lives as if we believe people are people. Keep that in mind. Now, that doesn't mean we're not mad. That doesn't mean we get aggravated, but there's a time and a place for that. And it's called an election and a vote. And we, unfortunately, live in a place and a time in history where people don't even know what truth is anymore. And we have to be careful what we say and how we say it. Because it's worth it. Now, turn to John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. So what happens is, Jesus comes to see John one day. And as we see here in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says this, the next day. So the, the politicians come and talk to him, and the very next day, Jesus comes to meet him. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I've said before me comes a man who ranks after me. Excuse me. After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. So John is having this conversation with himself. You see, he has an encounter with Jesus. And the first thing he says is, Behold, the Lamb of God. He came before me, but he's after me. Um, I loved playing basketball as a kid. Before, before I tear my knee up in the military, I loved playing basketball. And I was the oldest kid on my street. And I used to play basketball with this guy, Kim Ellis. He lived down the street from me. And I hit my growth spurt early. So how tall I was in sixth grade is pretty much how tall I am still today, okay? Well, at that time, I felt like I was pretty tall, you know? Because I hit my growth spurt early. And poor Kim, he hit his growth spurt much, much later. But he would play so hard when we were playing basketball together. He was just one of those kids. His, he had like an engine inside of him. And his dad was really tall and his mom was pretty tall. And I, I just never thought about it because I'm a kid and I'm playing basketball. And I would, like, I would back him down to the goal because I was so much taller than him and just do layups. It was awesome. Until he started growing. <laughs> and then... Right after I graduated high school and came back home, that boy hit his growth spurt. And I think he stopped growing. He was about 6'5", six, 6'3", six, something like that. And this guy, he got scholarship offers to play, I think, tennis and basketball. He had multiple scholarship offers for multiple sports because he came after me. But boy, he's before me. You know what I'm saying? He came after me, but he's better than me. He's taller than me. He's stronger than me. Lord knows he was faster than me because after that, I couldn't beat him anymore. So John is saying the same thing. He's like, he came after me, but he's before me. So he's talking about the preeminence of God, that Jesus existed in creation before all time. But he's also saying he was born after me on the earth and he ranks before me. He's more righteous than me. He's more godly than me. He's more humble than me. It's amazing. So just as I recognized with sports, John recognized that Jesus was before him and greater than him. He recognized those two things. Then John begins to give his testimony here. Uh, verse 32. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, and I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have bore witness that this is the Son of God. John is in this conflict throughout the rest of his life. He's having this discussion with himself about whether or not this is the Christ. And he says, behold the Lamb of God, but I, but I didn't really know. I thought he was, but I wasn't sure. And isn't it great to see that biblical figures and heroes of the faith... Great men of faith doubted and struggled and were uncertain. That makes me feel better. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove or as a dove. That word can be translated like or as. So either the Holy Spirit showed up in the form of a dove or it showed up kind of like a dove. We don't really know what happened. There's a mystery there. But what John says is, as I baptized Jesus, he... 
something happened that's different. As he came out of the water, the Spirit of God said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. And he came in the, in the form of a dove because he wanted to say something with that form of dove. Can we think of any other stories in the Bible where a dove shows up? As Noah was unsure about what was coming next, he sent a dove out to come back with a branch. And from that time forward in our history, it's been a symbol of God's hope and peace and presence in this world. That no matter how bad things get, that God is still with us. And that's what happens is a dove appears or something as a dove appears and brings that message of hope. And listen, the Spirit of God acts in your life today the same way He did that day. God continues to speak to us and give us hope and understanding and help in our presence. He's our ever-present help in times of struggle. One of the things God does to me is He puts verses in my mind when I need them. Sometimes it's things I memorize. Sometimes it's, it's things I haven't. He puts songs, hymns, or recent, more contemporary music. He, he, he puts them in my mind when I need it. The Holy Spirit still brings us hope and truth. He illuminates the scriptures as we read them. As you sit here listening to this sermon, you're going to get something from it that I didn't intend because God is mighty and works in ways that's beyond me and my intention. That's God. That's His Holy Spirit. That's His wonderful mercy. He's incredible. So John goes back and forth. He doesn't know, is this the Christ? Is this not the Christ? I think it's the Christ. But do you know what John does? He listens to God's confirmation of Jesus' identity. Now, how many times do we truly wait on God's Spirit to confirm the direction of our lives or our actions? Most of the time, what we do is we take action and then we say, God, why aren't you helping me? God, why aren't you in this? I, mean, I, know, I know I didn't pray um, when I met him. I, I know I didn't pray when I was dating him. But listen, we got three kids and he's being a jerk. Now I need you. Excuse me? Ask for God's confirmation in the midst of that dating relationship before you're married. It'll save you some trouble. Be careful. Listen, God's calling on my life was definitely a movement of the Holy Spirit. I remember going to my pastor. I was 28 years old. And I told my pastor, I said, I'm 28 and God wants me to preach, I think. And I said, but I don't really want to do it. I don't want to leave my career. I don't want to leave the direction of my life. i got to hit the reset button on my whole life right now. I don't want to do it. I'm going to be younger and more experienced than everybody I'm in classes with. And God didn't even tell me, Josh, you're going to get a PhD. Because I think I wouldn't have done it if he did, honestly. And at that moment, my pastor, Pastor Mike, turned to me and he said, Josh, you're the same age Jesus was when he began his public ministry. You'll be fine. <laughs> I said, okay. So uh, that was a confirmation in my life. And Mike said, what happens when you preach? Does it bear fruit? And I said, yes, people are impacted. I've gone in, in, into the prisons and I've preached. I've even gone when I just had my Bible and thought I was going to pray and no one else showed up and I had to just preach without a message in my heart and God gave it to me. He said, that means you're supposed to do it. I said, okay. I guess you're right. At the end of this verse, John says, I've seen a more witness that this is the Son of God, and I believe this is the Son of God. And he says, the truth has finally hit me. Listen, when the truth finally hits you, you can't help but declare it. Those nurses were hilarious. They handed me baby Judah, and they said, there's the diapers, and there's the milk, and the mother's asleep. Good luck. You know, now I'm a dad. 30 minutes ago, I wasn't a dad. I was just a husband. But now I'm a dad, too. My life is different now. And it, listen, and I'm not telling you something you don't know. It never ends, right? It never ends. It doesn't end at 15 or 20 or 30 or 40. It never ends. It's for the rest of your life, not their life. It's for the rest of your life. You're that person's father or mother. It's forever. John was changed by his encounter with Jesus. And his response to this encounter in John chapter 3, verse 30 says, He must increase and I must decrease. It's one of my favorite verses in the book of John. John understands I'm at the height of my fame. I'm at the height of my powers. I'm at the height of my influence. And God is asking me to step out of the way. He must increase and I must decrease. He gave away his fame, his popularity, his preaching ministry and pointed to Christ. He sacrificed his position to Christ and became less famous and had less followers. 
When we come to Christ, we give up some of ourselves. We give up some of the things we used to do that we used to like doing because now we want to bear fruit in keeping with repentance instead of just doing what we think is right. John found his true purpose. The whole purpose of John's life was to sacrifice his life and position in order to prepare people for Jesus. John the Baptist was uncertain about his legacy, uncertain about his future, imprisoned, awaiting execution, and he sends word to Jesus. And, and John's followers say, are you really the Christ? John, he's going to get executed soon. We don't know what's going to happen. Are you really the Christ? And Jesus tells them in Matthew chapter 11, verse 5, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. In other words, look at the fruit of the ministry. Yes. Ultimately, John loses his life. He's captured and he's beheaded and he's criticized for standing up what biblical marriage is. That's what he's killed for. Herod kills him because he marries someone he has no business marrying. Finding your purpose in life doesn't always go the way you expect it to. There's once a man who was a bus driver and he pulled up one day on his route, and the biggest man he ever saw got on his bus. This man was so big, he sort of blocked out light from the door as he came in. He was about six foot seven feet tall, about 350 pounds. And he came up to the bus driver, and he said, I don't pay for my bus rides. Bus driver said, okay, yeah. A couple days later, it happens again. He comes in. He says, I don't pay for bus rides. Okay. It happened another two, three, four, five, six times, and he can't handle it. It starts to get to his conscience. He's, he's, he's letting this guy ride the bus for free. And he realizes, I got to do something different. My encounter with this guy is not going to leave me the same. I got to do something different. And so he goes and, and he says, okay, I'm going to take some classes this summer. And he signs up for jujitsu. And he makes some counseling appointments because he's got such a low self-esteem. This little five foot three skinny fella. 150 pounds. He's ready. He goes back to work after about three or four months and he drives his bus that day and the man gets on the bus and he says, I don't pay for my bus ride. And the little man stood up and looked up at that tall tall person and he said why not you've been treating me bad so many days today you're gonna have to pay okay i just meant i i, I uh i have a bus pass that's why i don't pay you see, we don't have to understand our encounter completely to be changed by it, do we? We don't have to understand our situation completely to be impacted by it. We don't need to understand every verse of Scripture to be challenged to repent and bear fruit, do we? No. But what is God calling you to do today? As our musicians come forward and we prepare for a time of response, I ask you, how is God calling you to respond? Jesus told us to take up our cross and follow him. Are you encountering him today? It is impossible for us to leave the presence of God unchanged. We need to repent. Each and every one of us need to repent. Search your heart of what you need to repent of and give it to God that you can leave this time of worship closer to him, purified by your relationship with and to him. Seek that purity, seek that holiness, and pursue Jesus with all of your life and say, I must decrease and he must increase. Make that your prayer this morning. Follow John's advice. Find purpose and lose your life that you might save it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and the story of John, a man who was righteous and holy and was willing to be humble. And we ask, Lord God, that you would speak to each of our hearts here today. God, how are the ways that we have sinned in our lives? How have we made excuses for it? God, what in us needs to get, get rid of? Lord, how can we decrease and you increase in us? Is it our anger? 
Is it our resentment? Is it addiction to pornography? Is it addiction to our phones? Is it addiction to what other people think? Is it, is it just, ah, are we just so upset all the time these days? Let's get our emotional center and energy from our Savior and not from our current situation. Let us be like Paul who said, I've learned to be content in all things. God, give us this spiritual daily bread today. Meet our needs, show us where to repent, and let us walk out of here bearing fruit. Let's not be the type of Christians who are, woo, who are worshiping you at 11 o'clock and rude to waitresses by 12. Let's be the type of Christians who bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We ask this in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen.